Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Mike Phillips. Mike is co-founder and president of the Urban Cat League, as well as part-time community outreach coordinator for the New York City Feral Cat Initiative, a program of the Mayor's Alliance for New York City's Animals. Serious Animorc all began when Mike volunteered with the New York City cat adoption group Kitty Kind during a period of unemployment several years ago. Nearly overnight, he was the volunteer coordinator and was spending every free moment immersed in finding homes for New York's homeless cats. The next step was becoming president of Neighborhood Cats and starting the ongoing TNR training workshops, working to provide street cats with the best health care possible. This led Mike to pursue a degree in veterinary technology and become licensed in New York State. Forty years working in theater, including 20 years on the directing staff of the New York City Opera, Mike works full-time for the animals, and professional theater is now his hobby to earn a living. Though Mike works only pro bono as a vet tech over the years, in between opera seasons, Mike's had a long association working for the ASPCA for various special projects. He's worked as the veterinary technician supervisor at the ASPCA Adoption Center in New York City, as well as working in the Berg Memorial Hospital's ICU and on the ASPCA's Bobble Spay Neuter Clinics. After Superstorm Sandy, Mike volunteered as veterinary administrator at the ASPCA FIR Emergency Foster Shelter to help families at risk to keep their animals. Most recently, he was recruited to be the founding supervisor for the ASPCA's Neonatal Kitten Center. Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, Stacy. Thanks for having me. So that is a long list of accomplishments and activities that you have done over the years. Yeah, but you got me beat. 20 years, I've only been doing uh, TNR and feral cat work for 17. So you're ahead of, you're ahead of me. <laughs> well, those three years made a huge difference. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the first sort of spark that got you involved with helping cats? Well, let's go to community cats. You mentioned in my bio, I was working with uh, rescue and adoption and then became aware to me that New York City was full of street cats, community cats. And I had no idea because I live on the 43rd floor of a high rise and, you know, took the elevator, went to the street, went into buildings, and I did not realize that there was a whole other population in the city. And I lived in Midtown Manhattan, where we do have feral street cats, but they're very stealth, and one doesn't even know they exist until they're called to your attention. So I became aware of a colony of 75 cats living in the inner block right off Central Park West behind the famous San Remo residence. If you see those pictures from Bow Bridge of the two towers in Central Park, that's the famous San Remo residence. So I was absolutely blown away that there were 75 cats. I mean, I didn't know there were any cats living in the street, but they had 75 of them living in this inner block. And so overnight, I was just sort of thrown into, I didn't, had never heard of TNR. I didn't have any idea what to do. The next day, as fortune would have it, I was at a conference at the ASPCA and sitting next to me was Annabelle Washburn. I don't know if you, if your uh, listeners know who she is, but she became sort of the poster girl for TNR years and years and years and years ago. Cat Fancy did an article about TNR. We're talking like in the 70s, I think, before Alley Cat Allies existed or anything. Yep. And a lot of people were doing TNR, but she was, in fact, I've written an article about her. You could see it on the uh, blog on the Feral Cat Initiative nycferalcat.org. I did a tribute to her and she just was one of the people doing it, but she was so articulate, so well-spoken and so well-informed that she sort of became the poster girl for TNR, although she makes no claim to being the only person doing it. Anyway, she said, oh, you should call Becky Robinson at Alley Cat Allies. Well, I didn't know anything about it, but this is how long ago this was. It was 1999 
phone rings. Hello, this is Becky Robinson at Alley Cat Allies. May I help you? And it's, I don't. It's, I think it's been a while since Becky answers the phones, but that's how long ago it was. And so she gave me the short, the elevator speech, and said, "There was a. There's a group working in New York. I don't know. They just got started, but maybe they can help you. I think they have some traps." And it was Neighborhood Cats. So I called up Ruth Sharp, who was one of the founders, and she was very, very nice. And long story short, anyway, this is the main thing of the story that I like to share. Flash forward 2016, that colony does not exist anymore. Yeah, We did 100% TNR. And last year, we did humane euthanasia on the 18-year-old last survivor of the colony. And this is what, in any of the workshops that I teach, and whenever I talk about TNR, I say we have to do everything we can to get to 100% spay-neuter. You're in a caretaking situation for the lifelong care of the cats. You're not dealing with kittens. You're not dealing... You know, because the new cats that come onto the street, 90% of the time, they're domestic strays. They can be picked up. The bad side of that is 90% of the time they're unneutered. So if you don't get them right away, they may reproduce. But the new cats often don't need to be added to the colony. They can be adopted out. But so few people get to that 100%. You know, we, we really need those success stories where it really goes to zero. Right. Because that's the testimony that's going to prove and, and impress people how effective TNR is. Right. Well, and I believe Annabelle Washburn got to that level in, I believe she was Martha's Vineyard. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, correct. Okay. Absolutely. And then there's a very strong program in Nantucket also. In, in Newburyport, where we did our work, we started out with 300 cats. And by 2008, we had zero and um, still, you know, so we went from 14 feeding stations to just one to sort of monitor the area. And that is just feeding one indoor outdoor owned cat at this point in time. But we just sort of keep it there as a presence to catch anybody who may be dumped. But we haven't had any abandonment either, uh, really, since about 2006 in that area. So glad to hear it because those success stories of, re- you know, so many. I don't like to point the finger, but, you know, sometimes people fly under the banner of TNR and they're not really doing TNR and they're not ever getting to 100 percent spay neuter. So their neighbors and the community and the public officials are not seeing results. And they're saying, you said you've been doing TNR. It's been 10 years now and we still have kittens. What's wrong with this picture? Why aren't we believing you that this is the solution that we're all looking for? In New York, when we first got started, and and of course, I always have to tell people before cell phones, before the Internet, before you could just text somebody, hey, bring me a can of tuna, throw it over the fence. I'm over here with six traps. You know, you were if you were out there without that can of tuna, you were stuck. You had to pack up all your stuff, take it back, go by, you know, but. We started out and the ASPCA was immediately very uh, helpful. They started helping with uh, spay neuter. And then uh, several years later, the Mayor's Alliance for Animals came into play and they added services helping with the transportation for delivering traps, the Feral Cat Initiative and other groups and the ASPCA. We have Trap Loan. You can borrow 20 traps and have them delivered to you. You can have free spay neuter at the ASPCA clinic here in New York. Our Achilles heel is holding and recovery. Mm. And where we don't see the results we'd like to see that would really prove to the naysayers that TNR works is we can't do mass trapping in New York. And it's such a silly little obstacle. Well, it's not silly at all because it's really crumbling our our efforts. But we have free spay neuter. We have a trap bank. We have transportation to take the cats to and from. But in our high-rise apartments and our tight, tight living quarters. We don't have garages. We don't have basements. We don't have places to recover. We don't even have place to store the 20 traps if you wanted to do the mass trapping. You couldn't even receive 20 traps, let alone recover the cats or hold them before and after. So for lack of this one thing, 
we aren't getting the results that we would be getting if we could do mass trapping on a large scale. So what people are doing is they're doing two and three cats and it's taking them 10 years to get through a colony. And I'm sure every community has that one little Achilles heel, but that's what ours is here in New York is not having holding and recovery space. Right. Otherwise, we, I think we could just blow the world. I mean, with our services that we have, we could create statistics that would blow people's minds if we could do mass trapping on the scale that we have all the other services that would allow for us to do all that TNR. Mm -hmm. We have a, a I, I, when I was president of uh, Neighborhood Cats, we started a TNR workshop. And uh, I taught it in the very beginning, and then they had a very, very long hiatus, and now I'm teaching it again. We offer it twice monthly on a rotating basis all around the five boroughs, and we teach people best practices for caretaking. We teach TNR, trapping, special trapping techniques, uh, everything we can possibly cram into this three-hour workshop, which is uh, co-sponsored with the Mayor's Alliance for Animals, Feral Cat Initiative, the Alley Cat Allies, and the ASPCA. And that workshop, I, I never can remember, I think it was in the year 2000, we taught the first one. Well, apparently now like close to 5,000 people have taken that workshop in New York City. And yet, uh, when we look at who's done a, a, a project and brought cats in, it's barely a fifth of that. So people really want to do TNR. The services are there. But when we ask people, well, what's held you back? What's your problem here in New York? Why haven't you done that project? They always say, I don't have any holding and recovery space. I have nowhere to, to stage a TNR project. So that's New York's problem. I'm sure every community has their own stumbling block, but that's what we're up against here. Yeah, I would say for pretty much any urban area, you're going to run into that scenario. So it's, it's definitely a challenge in Boston. One solution that was used in Fitchburg, Mass, was the fire truck bay is used. That's used for holding a recovery for a, like a mass event on a weekend. So when the nice weather is out, but you know, you don't probably even have a place where the truck could kind of park temporarily on the street. That's a very, that is a very good idea. But when I'm thinking of 38th Street, where we had our, it's such a narrow street that if the part, if the truck were out, it'd be taking one full lane of a, of a, of a two, a very narrow two-way street. So, right. ugh, it's, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're hopeful. We're hopeful that with more and more awareness, uh, and we also have a network with those people, you know, to those people that do have a, because out in Queens and the Bronx, there are people that do have basements and have garages. And we try and connect people. One of the big things we have is networking. One of the most important things we have, uh, whenever we have an event, we try and network people and ask who's from what neighborhood and who's from where. And uh, I just, my heart flies when somebody from across the room says, uh, Oh my God, it's you, Shirley. We've texted, we've emailed these people who've been, you know, working sort of under the radar, but then they see each other face to face for the first time. And we try and network people so that if one person does have transportation or does have a garage or does that, these people can uh, share it between them and uh, help each other with projects. And that's the great thing about the double edged sort of, you know, 5,000 people have taken this workshop. Well, that's 5,000 people wanting the services of the program. In the beginning, we were just begging people to do TNR and hoping that they would avail themselves of the free spay neuter and the trap bank and this and that. And now it's like, oh, my God, there's 5,000 people that want these services. And it's trying to keep them not being frustrated and, and keep up with their uh, keeping them enthused and getting the services to them. Right. But then now that we're realizing, oh, my God, these people can help each other. Now that it's taken momentum and there are this many people, the program can make use of that as part of the program. It's the networking is really the next big frontier for the program. It's making it almost an organic program. And I'm almost envisioning almost an Airbnb type model in terms of finding out who has holding space available 
that people can network into. We had a group call different people working for the Mayor's Alliance and the Feral Cat Initiative. And then we sort of all at the same idea went, oh, my God, we should do startup groups. We're going to pick some place, some greasy spoon or some bar or somewhere in the Bronx. And we're going to say, hey, everybody in this zip code or in this area, we're going to have a meetup on Friday. Anybody that's doing TNR. We're all going to come there and we'll, okay, talk about cats, but let's talk about life and meet each other and get to know each other and give each other a little support. So that's something that I hope we have. We haven't done it yet, but I'm really hoping that's something that we're going to do to create a community, not of just of cats, but a community of humans. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Ready to make a big difference for cats in your community? We've got an exciting opportunity that can jumpstart your efforts. The Community Cats Podcast has launched Community Cats Grants. When you qualify for this innovative program, you'll gain valuable knowledge about how to raise funds for your spay-neuter efforts. Plus, we'll match the funds you raise up to $1,000, doubling your ability to make a difference for cats. Fundraising doesn't have to be scary. We'll be with you every step of the way. Check it out. You can find all of the details on the Community Cats podcast website under our education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. Can you touch a little bit about sort of the what the history of community cats has been like in New York City, the involvement of Maddie's Fund and the Mayor's Alliance, and then maybe take it and go forward and say, what do you think things are looking like for community cats going forward? When Ruth Sharp and I, who was the president of Neighborhood Cats just after me, and she and I went around to all the major players in New York and we had meetings and spoke. And oh, actually, I have to do a shout out to uh, Bonnie, who Bonnie Brown, who put us together, Stacy. Mm-hmm. She was one of the very first people we met with when she was working at New York City at the Animal Control Center. And she was incredibly supportive. And we got really robust support from the ASPCA, the Humane Society, um, from Bonnie and the people there at at Animal Control. And oh, before I forget, well, let me finish that thought, but remind me about ear tipping in New York. If you can, if you do, if you think of it, I'll talk about ear tipping. But you know, when we started out in the beginning, we didn't realize how important it would be to try and put all of these services that were being offered, the free spay neuter, the trap bank, the transportation, to get it in a a central network so that somebody that's new to TNR, they come to the workshop, they're completely overwhelmed. After three hours, their eyes are rolling back in their head thinking, oh my God, am I going to be able to do this? Because uh, it is overwhelming and it never gets really easier, but you do get better at it. I mean, I don't mean that it it does get easier. It never gets emotionally easier. But you get better at it. So you, you've you seen that scenario before and you respond to it better the next time. But what we're really with, with New York, we still are in a little bit of a, a thing where people have to make several phone calls. You go one direction to get traps, another direction to get spay-neuter appointments, another direction to arrange transportation to have those traps delivered. It's still a little complicated I would encourage anybody that's starting a program and getting a response to try and somehow make it cohesive so that that person can make one phone call, get the spay neuter, get the traps, get the transportation or whatever the services may be, but make it as easy as possible. Because I think the one thing that's overwhelming still in New York is that it's just not really, really, really simple. But whenever people are just starting out and uh, feeling really completely overwhelmed, I always quote that fantastic Marianne Williams thing she said. And, and I, it always chokes me up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they, my family, we say we cry at card tricks. We get choked up over anything. But this, this thing she, Marianne Williams said, she said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. You know, people need to be encouraged that, you know, you can do it. You can try, strive, help the cats, get the community on board. It's exhausting. You have to talk to so many people. You never know who's going to be that helpful person, whether it's going to be the community board or the council member or just somebody around the corner or a business owner. 
but it's you never know who it's going to be and it only takes one person or one foothold or somebody that has some influence to help you but you just have to keep reaching out until you get that foothold and you find somebody in the community that's going to be supported we were very lucky in new york that we had so much support we still have quite a struggle ahead of us but ear tipping and I don't know if this is common around the country, but in New York City, an ear chip of a cat has an additional, in addition to, of course, preventing the cat from being reoperated, it's clearly been already neutered or spayed, and it has been vaccinated for rabies, which, of course, helps with health department if there's ever an issue of that. Well, and it helps the caretakers to see in the dark if they've got 12 jet black cats, you know, if one of them is which one is which. But in New York City, it's also a life insurance policy at animal control. If an ear tipped cat comes into animal control in New York City, it will not be put down. It's photographed and we have an ear tip alert and a photograph goes out around to the caretakers in the area from which the cat was brought in. And the cat will be returned to the colony. They will not put the cat down. That's excellent. Yeah. So that's that's one of the benefits here in, in New York, that we have registration of colonies is completely private. It's not something that's going to be used against the cats. But that allows us to know if a cat comes in from a certain area, a registered colony, we know, oh, there's two colonies within a few blocks of there. This, let's make sure we get the picture to these people first. And then they expand out until they find who thinks that cat came from their colony so, and it can be so, returned. So, Mike, if uh, people are interested in finding out more about your work um, and about the Urban Cat League, how would they find you? Well, we have urbancatleague.org. That's one word, urbancatleague.org. We have some videos and information about, well, our specialty is taming feral kittens. We have a video there, which will very soon be updated. I've been saying this for 10 years, but we have a, a video that's, oh, God, got to be 12, 13 years old. And I've been, uh, I'm very, very close to updating it. You can email questions about taming kittens or anything on our website, urbancatleague.tamingferals at gmail.com. And that goes straight to me. I'm happy to answer. I get, I get questions from all over the world about taming feral kittens and I have handouts and techniques and we have the video link that I send out to people and coach them through the process. I don't know. I get a lot of a lot of enjoyment out of following the progress of people that maybe didn't just have the simple insight they needed into how to gain the trust of a kitten or an older, especially older kittens. Under eight weeks, it's a cakewalk. But we've had a lot of success with kittens eight weeks to six months old and in certain situations, coaching people into taming them for adoption. Excellent. We'll make sure we get that information in the show notes, too. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today, Mike? Oh, I just want to thank them for their work. And um, if they listened all the way through, well, thanks. And apologies for me blubbering away. But I do get so emotional about this. It's just such rewarding work when you confront the day and then the next one. And, it, you know, you have a great success story and something goes well. But then that next day, it doesn't make it any easier just to confront what we all confront. We're all in it together, and I hope we can gather gather some uh, strength from knowing there are others out there. We don't even know each other, but we're there. One step at a time, and sometimes it feels like it's one step forward and three steps back, but then some days it feels like it's three steps forward and one step back. So we're making progress. No matter what we're doing, we are making progress. And, you know, even if I always tell people if they're frustrated that they can't do a mass trapping and they can't get to 100%, Every single cat they neuter, even if it's just a one-off, it is a tremendous improvement in that one cat's life. Yep. So it's not going to be trying to raise kittens in the street, and it really is a health. It's not going to be chasing after cars, fighting with other cats, being hormonal. Just reassure yourself, even if I go slowly and it takes me a long time to get through the colony, each and every cat is a good thing. Mike, I want to thank you again for agreeing to be a guest on my show, and I look forward to having you on in the future. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you for listening to Community Cats Podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 